I get up in the morning and, and, I, and I have a cup of coffee and then I look at the hardest thing I've got to do that day. And that's what I do first. just so many facets to this music industry that people don't know the, the people who you know who run the doors the people who who print the t-shirts the people who come up with designs um the you know the the, the truck drivers the, the crews the lighting techs uh, the riggers you know riggers will come in at the end of the night and you know like you know we do these big big concerts you know major concerts and and walk away and jump in our cars and drive home and these guys come down in the pouring rain tear the show down and have it ready to go by the next day so, you know, 100 kilometers away, or 500 kilometers away. And in the old days, it used to be 1,000. Well, in the old days, the, the entourage was 200 people. You know, when, when U2 and Madonna came out all those years ago, 200 people was not that unusual. Well, well Prince had 250 people. These days, it's 40 or 50 people. It's this web of really skilled, really committed people who necessarily have to collaborate from a a really different range of uh, backgrounds and professions and approaches. What the crew's like is so important, you know, I mean, you know, I did Ozzy Osbourne's first solo tour, for example, the Blizzard of Oz tour. It was a nightmare. It was horrible. But the crew were amazing. They were such professionals and such, and all such top of their game, you know, and they'd been brought in to do this tour to keep it together, you know what I mean? People are realising what a privilege it is to work at something where you feel that's your purpose you're, and you're so connected to it and you're so committed to it. And when, when you're separated from it, you realise this isn't just a job, this isn't just what I do, it's, it's I, I love it. These people uh, are just normal. In fact, they live a very pressured, uh, hard life and they need someone like me just to talk to um, because um, I'm not on their payroll and I just tell them how it is and they like it. People who worked in our industry kind of falling through the cracks when they hit tough times. So, you know, whether it be through injury or illness uh, or some other crisis really impacts on the on an individual's ability to make money, that in the absence of, a, of unions and industry supers and all that kind of stuff, that the, it was the right thing to do for the industry to come together and provide a safety net for those people. Uh, so hence why, uh, with the support of uh, ARIA and APRA AMCOS and PPCA, we were able to start uh, Support Act. Contemporary music, from a mental health point of view, from a widespread point of view, is become so, so important and we're very lucky um, in Victoria because we've got a government that's really supporting it. In those weird days in mid-March when we got everyone in the creative industries together. The Friday of that week, so Friday the 13th, we were, um, we were all called to a meeting at the State Library with the Minister for Creative Industries, Martin Foley. And when this very earnest person from the public health team was just describing what we were requiring people to do, it kind of hit me like a sledgehammer that we were willingly asking people to shut down their entire sector. Was, what? <laughs> you know, and, and, and talking through what, what it was going to mean and we talked about mass gatherings and, you know, social distancing and... Overnight, completely and for a period of time that who know who knew when we would reopen. And in that moment, it just was crikey. It doesn't get any bigger than this. And it was sudden for all of us. And I think it was, it was a Friday from memory. The following week, I was looking forward to going to see things at Stone and Wood at, at the corner. When Scott Morrison announced that we were shutting down, I just thought, wow, this is going to be disastrous for us. You know, my, my artists can't tour. I was meant to be participating at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, which is 
over 100,000 people. I believe it was getting close to half a million people that would take over the entire city during that time. And it's a mix of music, film, gaming, comedy, everything. It was going on for months, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as bad as it was now, but no one really thought that it would take away our life. Gigs started to be closed down and, and um, uh, Blues Fest was, was cancelled. South by Southwest was cancelled at, you know, a moment's notice, really. I mean, that was meant to happen on March the 11th and they, they pulled the plug on that in the I think, 3rd or 4th of March. I mean, just unbelievable. My wife's a doctor in the emergency department at St Vincent, so there was also probably a fair amount of exposure to the medical realities through that period, which meant that, personally, I was probably a little more attuned to what the stakes were um, than, um, than might otherwise have been the case. Can I complain about it? No. I mean, I could, I could sit here devastated and go, oh, my God, what am I going to do and worry about it? But that's not going to change anything. So, you know, and I think that's a thing with production people as well. We're used to dealing with big problems and we're used to fixing them. You know, what's, what's tricky is we can't fix this one. When we first started isolating, really, because the Zoom and, and even even FaceTime, people weren't really connecting as much as they should. And and I think the process of of things like music from the home front, I've made people realise there's other ways of reaching out and 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 touching people. I guess the key issue, in a way, is is um, and I do a lot of work around personality um, work, and I, I guess one of the things that that comes across with people who who are attracted to that particular industry, you know, creative people very high levels of open to experience, so they're very curious, very um, uh, open to different ideas, different influences. Watching my artists, I realise how that connection with the audience is so important to them. And I mean, I think I already knew that because I, I would see them, you know, before a show and after a show, and I can see the transition in that human being from, from you know, that hour that they've had with the audience. Through trying to find that balance between being... Um, uh, vulnerable and resilient because you, you, you want to let your staff and, and stakeholders know that it's okay to be going through a hard time like you're going through a hard time this is hard and it's okay and no one's situation in this is going to be perfect the challenge in that first fortnight was literally we can't financially respond to every single case i think there's you know now a sort of a an awareness of support act throughout the industry that didn't exist before uh, and, and outside the industry, in the fact that you know the government's given ten million dollars to the to the organisation, well, that's a pretty big step. Thousands of people have rallied around to support each other, to get people through one pandemic with a counter pandemic of kindness and support and decency. Focusing on those things, they've been they've been the aspects that have um, kept, I'm sure people strong and the sector strong. It's really interesting when you listen to some of the stories, some of the people's stories about how they're coping with COVID-19 and how to live with life. Um, a lot of people saying it's really good to get, the, you know, one level there's this anxiousness associated with their loss of their livelihood, but another part of it is having some time out at home, you know, actually being at home and, and actually um, reading books or, you know, writing songs. We're all adapting and I think something that's helped me personally get through is just trying to find my own little routine and trying to find the positives in every day because, you know, some of the days have been hard. Losing all the jobs and not knowing where the future is headed or whether we're going to survive. It's been tricky, but I think something that's grounded me is definitely my little kitties and they've also been exhausting and hard to work around, but they're amazing. Um, but getting out there and trying to set a routine still, even though the situation has changed and we're facing changes daily still. And we have to just learn to be able to live within ourselves and relax. And, 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 and I think talking is, is the best way to, to do it. You know, getting out, you know, I, I think it's really important in times that you keep exercising too. You've got to keep, keep your, your heart, your, your body and your, and your mind all, all going at once. You know, I, I really try to keep as busy as I can. I've found, you know, in this time of isolation, I've been more creative than, than, than I have for, for years. It's been, it's been a godsend to me. And, and I remember sitting here at the start of it, kind of, you know, tapping my fingers, I'm wondering, you know, what am I going to do? And then I haven't stopped. You know, I've written a book, I've, I've written songs, I'm, I'm learning guitar. I'm learning bagpipes. <laughs> you know? The human body needs certain things. 
and, and a human mind. Okay, number one is exercise, aerobic exercise. Simple thing, it means going to the gym, going for a walk, going for a swim for 20 minutes, three times a week. There's two bits that happen during tragedy and during difficult times is people are influenced by safety needs. I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling, feeling fearful, and they want that met, that need met. But there's also another thing that happens with people is they also have a growth need, you know? So, so they're also thinking about, well, how can I learn, get out of this? So there's sort of two things happen at the same time simultaneously. Um, and I, and I see a lot of that in people, people are starting to realize, actually, I can do a lot of different stuff too. Like I don't have to be necessarily doing what I've been doing. So it opens up this innovation and creativity about people. So what I'm really interested in is what this will look like in six months time in 12 months time, what the industry would look like. The ability to uh, learn more so at a closer level, yeah, and, um, and to learn differently. And that to me is, is, is one of the best things that anybody can ever do, is to learn something in a different way. And it might, it might not, the subject matter might not be different, but you're learning in a different way. Some people have been impacted less because it's like they've lived in isolation for years anyway. You know, um, if you never had money to really buy much stuff off the shelves, empty shelves at the market didn't mean anything because they might as well have been empty if you were broke. Um, so it really depends on your circumstance, um, but it will definitely, definitely influence how we write. We're like, we're like normal people. I mean, it all looks like all nice and happy and rosy. We have fights. But then, then we'll just shake it off and we'll go and play a song and, and, just, and, and it balances us again. At the start, it was just sort of, it was sort of a bit of fun and, and Jane was starting to learn. Jane, Jane's incredible. She, she picked up, she, she's played a little bit of guitar over the years, not much. But from the, from the lockdown time, I gave her, I gave her a, a guitar that, that was really nice guitar that she liked. And I gave it to her and she sat and she's practiced for hours and hours every day. She loves it. She's, she's actually a much better guitar player than me. You know, I wanted to do, I wanted to make music with her just for, for us. And, and then we thought, oh, well, you know, we'll, sit, we'll post this one and see what people, and we just pick songs, you know. I, you know, I, I sang everything from Elvis Presley to Doris Day on these, on these, uh, on these little jam sessions we have. And, um, and every single song we do, someone, uh, you know, we, we, I think from, from, the, you know, uh, the, the first one, we've done about nearly 80 songs now, and, and I think we've reached like 75 million people. That's the, that's the connections we've had. And I've, I've, I've had so many people, that, you know, these songs, which I, I do be just because there's something, something that reminds me of something in my childhood, or Jane's got, Jane says, oh, I love this. And then the melody connects with you. These songs all connect with people. And I get people saying, you know, oh, this is the song that my mum sang. I haven't heard this song in 45 years. My mum used to sing it while she was cooking. Or, you know, and I'm going, they're just, just beautiful melodies. And so the music I started off just to entertain ourselves, but, it, but, it, but it's still it's something that we, every night we get something from, you know? One of the really amazing things has been the way that the industry has come together. And, you know, the kind of, communication and and you know positivity and creativity that it's come from within the industry and the and the sort of willingness i guess of yeah people who've maybe never worked together before arch nemeses in some cases to actually join forces and and really pull together has been yeah really amazing it's been an inspirational time for me personally um, i'm enjoying it i'm enjoying working so hard and loving it I'm enjoying listening to music more than ever. But what's been even more um, important, I guess, is how the industry has banded together, how different levels of government, different levels of community, and just thousands of people have rallied around to support each other. The, the willingness, I guess, of people to really step up into those very, into those very difficult decisions and um, with great courage and great grace under, grace under fire became a bit of a, you know, watch, watch phrase at the, at the, particularly at the beginning. I think, I think the, the, the most courageous thing I've ever done in my life was to say I need help. And I think 
that are, and it takes strength to do it. You know, there is still a big stigma attached to, to mental health and mental health has so many, you know, you don't have to be, you know, I used to think if you were seeing, if you were seeing a, a therapist, you were crazy, you know, but really if you're seeing a therapist, you're, you're very smart, you know, it's a good thing to do. And I think that we need, we all need to reach out. And it's not only just you seeing therapists, you know, it's talking to your friends, it's, uh, it's talking to your partners. It's, uh, it's not isolating, you know, like, you know, even in this time, you don't have to isolate, you can talk to people. And I think that that connection and just having that, that people who can, who can just sort of, you know, just say it's not, it's not that bad. You know, I've, I've felt that. It was like that thing about standing on each other's shoulders. You know, as a group, we are, we're capable of much more than we are on our own.